welcome to our webinar, Approaching Data with an Ethical Lens. Um, our speaker, Chris Harrison, will be discussing how you can frame ethical responsibilities when working as a data scientist. Chris is our data capability lead at BGSS and is a data scientist by trade. He embarked on the data science trajectory whilst applying ML to spatial and ecological problems during his PhD and has since worked in the industry for around four years across multiple vertical markets. Welcome, Chris. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Fern. And welcome, everybody. Um, so yes, I'm going to be giving a talk on uh, how we, how I approach data science with an ethical lens. Um, I think it is an interesting topic, and it is one that's quite close to my heart. So I'm going to enjoy giving this talk, and hopefully you'll enjoy listening to me. Um, I'm going to start with a quote. <clears throat> This is Aldous Huxley in an interview in 1958, and he said, all technology is in itself morally neutral. These are just powers that can be used well or ill. And I think we're all aware of the fact that this is the case. Um, he was talking about television at the time, and uh, he also related it to nuclear power, which is something that was on everybody's mind in 1958, I think. Um, and the fact that it can be used for good or it can be used for ill. And it's the same with any technology, anything powerful. And we're living in a quite an exciting time where AI and machine learning are affecting all of our lives. We, we, we interact with these algorithms much more frequently than, um, than you may be aware of. Um, but yeah, they are integrated into our lives through social media, through uh, our digital lives, especially during a lockdown. But the people who create these algorithms, well, not necessarily create the al algorithms, but use the algorithms to create models, which we'll talk about, uh, our data scientists. So it has to be at the forefront of our mind and we need to be constantly questioning as to whether the solution that we've created has the potential to be used for well and ill. Uh, is it something that can only be used for good? Or is it something that can only be used for ill? Um, and it's not a, a black and white story either. It's not nuclear annihilation or free energy for all. It's a spectrum. There are a, a range of uh, scenarios between that, uh, not necessarily nuclear power, but with data science, you, you can you can find yourself erring towards the good, or sometimes maybe the bad. In which case, it's time to readjust course and 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 think about what you're actually doing. <coughs> so, what am I going to be talking about? Uh, I'm going to give a brief overview of my background, uh, so that you know where I'm coming from uh, when I talk about the things I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm not going to focus on ethical theory. I'm not going to talk about specific problems um, or projects that I've uh, I've come across. It's going to be a very general talk. Um, and then I'll give you a very, in caps there, very brief introduction to data science machine learning. That's a, a subject in itself. You know, it's a, a degree course if, if you wanted, but it's going to be a very, very high level overview of what it actually means to be a data scientist. Then we'll get on to why ethics should be a primary consideration for a data scientist um, and how to navigate that. My field's a bit um, strong probably, but how do we, how do we navigate that, that, um, that lens, that journey when in, in terms of ethics and how do I frame any ethical considerations that may need to be brought up, uh, may have been brought up, um, how do, how do you navigate those as a data scientist and what can you do about it if you're not comfortable? <clears throat> Give some advice to new and aspiring data scientists. It's worth saying that this talk is aimed at a mixed audience. We've got participants uh, from a, a variety of backgrounds and companies. Uh, some of you are data scientists, so this is going to be um, hopefully familiar to you. If, if not, you know, you, you, you'll either have some something to uh, disagree with me about or you'll agree with what I'm saying and uh, feel free to um, to email me at the uh, after this we'll have a Q&A session at the end but if you want an in-depth conversation about anything then feel free to reach out to me you know, I'll provide my email address at the end um, obviously it's not just data scientists on this call so that's why we're going to have an introduction to data science uh, and hopefully you'll understand uh, where I'm coming from and we'll put it in the context of everyday life as much as I can uh, and then, yeah, closing statements and a Q&A at the end. So who am I? A question that I often ask myself. Uh, my background. So I was a data scientist when I was doing my PhD without realising that that was a job title. Um, funnily enough, the, the things 
that I was doing and researching and the way I was using data and using machine learning as a tool to find answers to questions in ecology and conservation are actually how data science is done. The, the, the workflow that I was following was the data science workflow that I work in now. Um, obviously, it's, it's slightly different working in industry uh, because it's not the same subject matter, but data can be treated in the same way. There's similar considerations need to be taken into account. Um, the science part of data science is, in my opinion, the operative word. Data is something that all scientists use. Um, so the job title itself isn't immediately transparent. I think that's why you get some confusion about what data science actually is um, and who data scientists actually are and what, what we do. But primarily we are scientists. So we, we, we follow a scientific method uh, for forecasting and predicting um, all manner of things uh, which is what machine learning is, and we'll, we'll get onto that. So, I'm a biologist, um, so a scientist uh, specialising in conservation and ecology. Previously, my specialism is now data science and machine learning. Um, although I still have a strong interest in conservation and ecology, uh, a curious mind and a strong desire to experience and understand the world. Now, the reason why I put that there isn't because I want you to know how free thinking I am or anything like that. Uh, I think this is true of all data scientists. We, we are, and scientists in general, uh, we are curious minds. And that desire to experience and understand the world um, is a really key feature in, in being creative when you're thinking about how to frame problems and what it is that you're actually asking a computer to do when you, uh, when you set it up to perform machine learning. A geek slash nerd. I don't know which one I am. Um, I've got that image on the right. I don't know whether that's representative of what geeks and nerds actually look like. Uh, I'll leave you to make an opinion on that. Um, and yeah, I do. I love my job. I think it's a fantastic um, subject to be involved in, especially in this day and age where AI is is at the forefront of, of technology. It's integrated all over the place. Uh, and yeah, it, it, it's a, a really... Uh, I'm really privileged to be involved in it. <coughs> Educator, evangelist, and aspiring influencer. When I say evangelist, I'm talking about uh, being a data science evangelist. Um, I'm, uh, the, the potential for data science and machine learning to do good, or for people to do good with machine learning and data science is, is overwhelmingly positive, and uh, I'm a big um, advocate of, of data science for all good. Uh, hopefully I'm an educator, I guess you'll form an opinion on that by the end of this talk, whether you've learned anything or not. Aspiring influencer insofar as I think um, it's important to talk about what we're talking about here, ethics, um, be open about what it means to be a data scientist, what it means to be involved and working in tech. Um, and yeah, in, in a positive sense, uh, influence people's opinion in a positive light and I think that's important as, as I said on on the introductory text when you signed up for this talk data science has had some bad publicity in recent years and and that's actually a byproduct of the way some of these stories have been presented it's not this it's not data scientists who have um who are at the heart of the misuse of some of the uh, uh, some AI solutions that you'll be familiar with? Like I say, I'm not going to go into specifics of, of what they are and uh, who they are, but needless to say, that you know, the, it, there's been a lot of noise around social media and how social media is able to influence people, how algorithms can affect the way people live their lives and make decisions, and that's not data science. That is, you know, it's a bigger thing. Data science is is at the heart of, of, of building those systems, but we don't work in isolation. And the overwhelming majority of data scientists have, an, um, have, a, have a good ethical compass and will recognize that um, certain use cases aren't appropriate as and when they arise, and they'll communicate those up the chain so that hopefully um, you should never get into a situation where, where you, you're causing harm. <coughs> So DS and ML, that's data science and machine learning. A brief intro, right? This is gonna be a really quick intro to data science from a very, very high level. So let's see how it goes. 
So what is data science? It's different for different organizations. And that is, it's fundamentally the same job, but um, it depends on the availability of data within a company and maturity of the, of, I say company organization and the maturity of that organization. Data science as a, as a workflow and machine learning have been around for, for a while. Um, but not forever. And a lot of companies are only just entering into that space. Um, and it's, it's a matter of taking small steps first. So data science isn't just ML. That is one part of data science. There's a whole raft of other techniques that you need to be implementing statistical techniques and exploratory techniques, good scientific, scientific practice. And the availability of data is, is an important one because some companies have big data which is allows ML solutions, which are far more powerful than small data, but you can still perform data science and machine learning on, on small ish, medium sized data sets. Um, and they may uh, or, or, or can provide value to, to organizations. Um, it's an applied discipline. So my background is very much applied. It was in conservation and using machine learning to classify satellite imagery for habitats and creating things called species distribution models, which is um, using machine learning to determine where certain uh, species may or may not be when you can't go out and look for them because of the landscape or, or land access issues or, or just the sheer scale at which you're trying to determine these things. Um, but data science is applied. It's, we're not machine learning researchers. We don't, uh, when you're in industry, you're not developing new um, algorithms and ways of, of doing machine learning. You, you're adapting the workflows that exist already and the algorithms. And when I say adapting, these are very flexible. There's a lot of work and a lot of things that you need to think about around that, but we're not focusing on one particular mathematical equation uh, that will you know, revolutionize machine learning. If you get to do that as well, then happy days. That's that's you're very lucky, and you know we, we all like to read around that and and keep our eyes on on the latest research that's that's out there. But it is an applied discipline. Uh, sector agnostic, and touched on that. So I come from a conservation background, but the techniques that I learned during my scientific training as as, as a as a biologist are extremely relevant, um, and they. Uh, the, they, they can be applied across multiple sectors. Um, the same techniques apply. Um, statistics and machine learning are at the heart of it. We've been through that. Uh, science, operative word, already said that. Um, and it's, I say it's one of a handful of jobs where you pay to think as a primary function regardless of seniority. And, and when I want to say a handful. There are lots of jobs. You can think as much as you want in a job, can't you? It's just not required. Uh, in, in some jobs and in some cases, you're only required to think within a very constrained framework. The data science, you've got to really be thinking um, as a scientist and in terms of hypotheses and possibilities and probabilities, um, you have to think very broadly. It's a lot of fun. And uh, say we'll talk about bias later. I'm obviously biased towards being a data scientist because I am one and I enjoy it. But um, I think it, it is a fun job. Uh, and and it, the community is very lively and it's a nice place to be. Uh, and people are willing to engage in lively debates about the best way to do things and application of AI, all of those things is, is, is good fun. <coughs> and that scientific approach, um, the scientific methodology, uh, scientific method uh, and the due diligence that, that provides the framework that, that surrounds it. Um, is a safety net, and, and you should be using that to determine whether your um, whether your 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 work and the solutions, not just yours, but the organisation that you work for, uh, and the and the pieces that you're contributing towards that, does it slot into um, an ethical framework? And ethical frameworks are relative and differ between different people within parameters. Um, so it's important to remember that as well. You know, it, it, you have to think objectively and. Although your, your subjective compass will influence you, hopefully your subjective compass when you're in the workplace is kind of objective anyway. You know, it, it's, it's not about applying your political motivations or whatever it is to, to, to the work that you're doing. It's about thinking about how does this benefit 
one the organization that you work for uh, and in some cases if you're lucky enough to work in something which is going to have a huge impact then how does it benefit society okay what is machine learning so 1959 Arthur samuel field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without explicitly being programmed and that's the crux of it really it's a really old definition but it still stands and it's it's not an entirely um descriptive insofar as we do have to do programming <laughs> you know that's that's our bread and butter we, we are uh, programming all day uh, data sciences everything we do is code <clears throat> for the most part um but it's the the fact that this the decisions at the heart of the code that you write uh, are, are flexible and based on algorithms that have been coded and written but the computer will adjust the maths in there based on um uh, based on what what you want to show it to learn from, which we'll get into. Uh, Tom Mitchell, 1997. I've left this in here. This is from uh, an older presentation, a more technical presentation, but I think it's it's good to leave there and, and have a think about um, an improved definition. A computer program is said to learn from experience with respect to some class of tasks and performance measure. If its performance at tasks in, in T as measured by P improves with experience C. So if you uh, allow a computer program to gain experience and that might be through um, showing it data and showing it what good looks like or what reality looks like uh, that's the experience um, and the, the task will be the job of the machine based on that experience what is it going to do uh, and you have to have some uh, way of measuring that, uh, that uh, how, how it's actually learning and um, how it's performing over time it's a branch of computer science, machine learning, um, many, many real world applications. We won't go into specifics of that one at time. Uh, and it's about finding relationships in data. It's about finding patterns and then it allows actionable in, insight for, for humans fundamentally. And ML, it, you hear it, machine learning and artificial intelligence being used synonymously, but they're not, not quite the same, but ML is, is at the heart of modern uh, artificial intelligence. And data scientists are the people who, who build these things as part of a team, along with a whole raft of other people, which uh, is worth mentioning. But there are machine learning engineers, devs, um, many, many people who get involved in these projects. Okay. So I'm going to talk about two types of machine learning, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So supervised learning, and very, very quickly, um, data are labeled with a response variable. Now that means if you're a statistician, you might know that as a dependent variable. Um, so you're using dependent variables to predict a, uh, independent variables to predict a, a dependent variable. Um, it's easier to think of it as you use data and inputs to predict uh, an outcome uh, and these th this has been measured beforehand so that's where the supervised element comes in it means that we've got a lot of data that says um, based on these traits or things we call them features um, this was the outcome of, of that so for instance you might, you might look at um, weight gain in lockdown so you 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 you'd have the, uh, the response variable would be the amount of weight gained. And then the features that you put into that will be everything that you think is relevant uh, towards weight gain in lockdown. And you, that would be a regression task, which is on the right there. If it's to, predicting numbers like that, that's a regression task. If you, you frame it as a classification problem, which is on the left, you might say um, have overweight or underweight. Um, you know, you, you, could, you can bucket those data into, into categories and then it becomes a classification test. But fundamentally, it's about uh, relating. So all those things about lockdown, how long have I been in lockdown? Do I live alone? Uh, do I cook? All of these things, they're the features uh, and you have the label. So you have a lot of, in order to perform supervised learning, you need a lot of these, these data to, to do this historically label. So it could be automated, maybe that it's a web form, people are filling it in. It could be a census, something like that. Um, and then you use those uh, those labeled data to, sh to, to, to run through a, a machine learning algorithm. And at the end of it, the machine should be able to generalize the new cases. So you only need to show it uh, the details of somebody's lockdown experience and it will predict whether they're 
overweight, underweight, or gained weight, whatever it is that you use as your response variable. And so, so there's always error that's worth, worth mentioning as well. So you can see on the, on, on the left, the classification, we're trying to split between crosses or uh, crosses and plus signs and circles. And there's a decision boundary in the middle there, that dotted line. And it, it is maths, you know, that, that this is a, effectively a graph. There's no axes on it, but that is a mathematically defined, excuse me, decision boundary. On the right, it, it, this is probably the one that most people are more familiar with. It's about finding a line of best fit, if you like. I know it's not always a, a straight line like this. Sometimes it's a, a wavy line, um, but it's about finding a single function or line uh, which best describes the data that you're looking at. Unsupervised learning. So this is this is another type of machine learning where there aren't those outcome data. So if we don't have people's weights, for instance, but we have their lockdown experiences and the details about the lockdown, but we don't know anything about their weight, for instance. Um, and it's used to unearth natural patterns in data. So you can see this is a this is one form of unsupervised learning called clustering. On the left, that's the original data. It looks like nonsense, really. It's just numbers. Um, but we can use machine learning to find natural patterns in those data. And that's what's shown on the right there, that the computer has determined uh, that there are three clusters, so green, blue, and red. And that's based on some fundamental differences between those groups based on the data. So it could be that um, you, you take your lockdown experience data, run the clustering algorithm on this, and it finds natural groups. It doesn't know what those groups are, you've got to label them afterwards. So it'll say that these seem different based on the data that you said, this is the maximal separation we can get from these three groups. Um, computer doesn't know what, what they relate to. You've got to look at the data and explore it and actually provide a reasonable explanation for each of those um, groups. Okay, so there you go. You're all experts in data science and machine learning now. Um, why should ethics be a primary consideration in data science? Okay, so this is the, the juicy stuff now. Um, just because you can do something, it's an old uh, adage, it doesn't mean uh, that you should. Now, data science is experimental. So you do have some freedom to do things which won't affect anybody. You, 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 we always develop in an environment which is not live, it's not gonna, immediately be seen by people or make any decisions in, in the wild, so to speak. Um, we, we, we have safety nets and frameworks whereby we can experiment and iterate. And so we, we can do things that won't have any impact and we can actually explore what the impact will be as well. So it, there is an experimental element and it's more, more probably more relevant to say just because you can productionize something, i.e. Make, uh, make it available to the public or your, your client or whatever it is, um, then that's when maybe you should think about it and, and have a look at what you're actually going to be um, releasing and, and using and how that can impact society uh, or, or individuals or the environment or, or whatever it is um, that you're framing your ethical compass around at that particular moment in time. <coughs> um, the <laughs> The dude abides, uh, the, 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 I am a big GIF fan, but this poor guy is uh, sprinkling the ashes of his friend over a, uh, over a, uh, over a cliff onto, into the ocean because his, his friend likes the ocean. So it's a nice gallant effort, you know, really well thought, but he didn't take into account what way the wind is blowing. So his, uh, his friend's ash ends up all over his other friend. Uh, good intentions, badly executed. And that's what we want to avoid. Um, so yeah, we need to be thinking about things like well, what are the benefits of what we're doing? And th this isn't your job as a data science in isolation. These are things that you talk about with the people who hold the purse strings ultimately and, uh, and people who are aware of uh, the implications or, or, or the, the reach that your solution is gonna be, is gonna have, how many people are gonna use it? Um, how are the people that use it, the people it affects, these kind of things. But you, you need to be thinking about them as a data scientist as well, um, because you are going to be using data to build systems which will make decisions. Well, not necessarily make decisions, but will provide um, predictions which can be either used to make decisions um, by humans or if you're monitoring your, your machine learning solution, 
and you can allow it to make decisions, but you need to keep a close eye on it. It's always in harmony with, with humans. That, that's important to remember. You know, you don't allow ML solutions to run amok. Um, yeah, okay, so we're going to talk about bias, but is the solution benefiting some more than others? Is it having an adverse impact on, on some people, but not others? Is it having an, an overall adverse effect? Is it behaving the way you expect it to? All of these questions are, are, are things that you need to think about. I'm going to talk about some of those. So we'll talk about bias first. Um, bias is, is, is a hot topic and it, it is important. It's very, very important. So it's important for society and making sure that we're not discriminating against certain groups of people unnecessarily. Um, I think it's, it's all about the inputs and about how you apply a solution. So you need to be sampling properly. We're going to talk about that. So when you when you build a machine learning solution, you're going to have to select what data you're going to use for that machine to learn from, and that's a really really important step because it can only can only apply its its it, what it's learned to the real world. So if you're showing it the wrong stuff and you teach it bad things, it's going to do bad things. Um, so it, it's really important to make sure that you're um, you're showing it the right data in in a in an appropriate way as well, and relevant data, um, including irrelevant things, can can be disastrous too. Okay, so influence as well. This is this is this is big insofar as it's it's probably um, the the. the the thing that people associate in a negative sense with data science and machine learning is that ability to influence it primarily through social media. Um, that is one very, very specific use case in terms of it, the use on social media. It's not just about social media. That is one very, very small um, subset of, of data science. But it is important to remember that um, if, you're, if you've got a, a machine learning solution that uh, is performing some task and that task affects people's lives or the way they do things or the things they can and can't do. It affects their perspective on reality. And that's that's a very powerful thing to be able to do. You know, and you're talking about en masse as well. Um, it's not just about influencing your neighbor or, you, or the people around you. You are potentially uh, influencing a, a vast raft of, of, of people. Something to keep in mind. and should you really be allowing a machine learning solution to influence anybody? Um, d d d again, it comes down to appropriate use, so appropriate sampling of data, making sure that you're monitoring uh, what the machine is doing over time and being ready to, to either pull the plug or, or retrain the model. We call it, say, retraining when we need to show it better data or more representative data. Um, society changes over time, so it's, it's important to remember that you will need to reteach your or give your your uh, machine learning solution some refresher training every now and again um because people change and if it's old learnings that the machine is basing its its decisions on or, or its predictions on um then it's only going to apply those it, it has no concept of, of the change that has happened until you you uh, you tell it basically and 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 actually uh provide the the machine some training can people gain the ML solution? So that's that's an important one to consider as well. So if people are able to manipulate the the data that the machine is predicting on, they may be able to um, gain unfair advantages over other people. Um, I, I won't go into any specific examples again, but uh, you know that it, it's easy to if you're inputting data about yourself into, I don't know, say a web form, and then a decision is made based on the inputs that you put in. If you aren't honest about that, and you decide to to lie uh, in in the sense which you know will most likely give you an outcome that you want, um, then you're gaming the system. And is that ethical? That's something to, to think about from the user's perspective. And can we avoid uh, this happening? How do we verify the data that is uh, that the, the model is predicting on. Uh, is there any way of automatically collecting the data? Is it ethical to do that? Uh, there's a lot of considerations. <clears throat> Turn it 
time, just looking at the time, sorry. Okay, so problem statement isn't always the issue. And, and that's, we kind of touched on that already. I think the, the fact that deciding what you're going to use an AI or machine learning solution for is, is, is just the first step. So, you know, once you've determined the overarching use case, then you've got to start thinking about the details and that's where it gets complicated. So there's lots and lots of considerations and we haven't got time to go into them all, but where's your data coming from? Have you gained it legitimately? Are you sure that you can use it for this person? Is there, sorry, for this purpose? Do people need to consent to it? Um, it may be that the solution isn't people oriented at all. It could be something which it helps, uh, I don't know, um, a production line or, or something like that that is, uh, is inefficient. You know, it, it's not always about people. It's, it's about process as well. Um, are the data appropriate for the given use case? Uh, and can, the, can your machine learning solution be used for purposes other than you originally intended it to be used for? Um, it can happen, uh, you know, and, and it's not necessarily that the end users will, will use it for or can use it for, for nefarious purposes or, or, or for purposes that weren't, it wasn't originally designed for. Sometimes it's important to remind stakeholders and people within your organization that it's not as simple as, simple as just taking one machine learning algorithm uh, or AI and then using it for everything for other purposes. You, it needs to be thought about and designed from the ground up each time, unless it's a very similar use case and you know at what stage uh, you're departing from the original use case and then you can maybe just under, re-undertake uh, or rethink part of the process. But it's important to remember that these aren't um, things that you can just drop and drag and drop into, into any situation. It may work, but that's the danger, is the fact that if the data are similar, it may actually provide predictions, but you have no way of knowing why it's doing that for a start and and whether it's appropriate uh, until it starts making those predictions and then uh, you're already in hot water probably uh, okay so there's always error and we keep on saying this there is always error machine learning solutions aren't perfect so they, they, they are fallible uh, they, they will get them hopefully if you've you've created a good machine learning solution they'll get it right the majority of time of the time but there is always a level of of error, and that's that's common across statistics. That is a statistical property. You know, um, not everybody is the same, um, and in some cases, it, it, there are acceptable limits for this. And that's something that you need to communicate with your stakeholders uh, and the people who are, are in charge of, of, of paying for these solutions or deploying these solutions or using them. You need to communicate what level of error um, ha, is, is your machine learning solution likely to. Uh, um, to, to, to have what level of error. Okay, things like um, handwritten writing recognition, you know, we all, or, or predictive text, these kind of things, you, you know, it doesn't get it right every time. Uh, it's the same principle. It, sometimes it, the effect will be a, a frustration as it might be with predictive text. You know, you end up having to select a word manually. Oh gosh. Um, but in some cases it can have really devastating consequences. And sometimes you need to think is a, a machine learning solution appropriate at all. It's probabilistic. It's using probability to determine whether something is likely to be something or not, which is what we do as humans. Um, but with computers, we can have deterministic processes as well, rule-based systems whereby we know exactly what an outcome will be based on a set of pre-written rules. It's laborious and it takes a long time to write those, those rule-based systems and they take a lot of maintenance, which is why uh, ML is, is appealing also ML has the opportunity to find new patterns that we just didn't think of before. <clears throat> um, and yeah, data science, at the start of any data science project where you undertake exploratory data analysis. So we, we need to understand the data. We need to understand uh, what the statistical properties are of that data set, uh, whether it's appropriate um, in, in its current form, it might need transforming into a new form to format. We call that feature engineering. Um, lo lots of uh, graphs that we, can communicate our findings uh, to, to project managers and stakeholders and, and colleagues to say, we found these properties within this data. 
we might need to do something about that. Um, we might not be sampling appropriately, all of these things. But that, that's a really important phase. It's not about just going straight into machine learning, right, let's push this data through a machine learning algorithm and see yeah, if it's going to be fine. That's that's not, not a good way. You need to understand your data. It may mean excluding certain um, features, so elements, you know, if, if you think it's going to discriminate and because you've included something in there that isn't relevant to what you're doing, um, then that's that should be excluded from the data. So it's about tidying the data and making sure it's appropriate for the use case and also has to be in the right format for the machine learning algorithm as well. It's maths and it's expecting uh, inputs in a certain format. So it's our job to make sure that that's all undertaken. Um, there are lots of proponents of AI for good. Um, it's not just about thinking about the data science uh, workflow and whether you're doing things appropriately for a given use case. The, the use cases can be framed you know, ethically as well. Not everything is, is as clear cut as that. Some, some things are quite um, mundane, if you like, you know, machine learning tasks, but you can use machine learning and data science for some really, really good purposes. And, and it's important to remember that. And, uh, and if you're interested in, in data science or you're interested in, in machine learning and you want to get involved in some of these projects, um, there are, uh, there are um, what do you call them? Uh, summits, so sorry, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. AI for good summit, that's what the image is on the right. Uh, and this is alongside the United Nations. Uh, you know, you can really clue yourself up in how machine learning and the things that you do as a data scientist, although you may not be um, changing the, the world dramatically in, in, your, in your day job as, as a data scientist uh, within a company, um, it is happening and you can, you can get involved with that if you want, or at least clue yourself up so that you, you, you've got good stories to tell about the kind of work that you do. Um, so yeah, some examples of, of, of uh, AI for good projects. Now these five bullets are taken from Microsoft. They have the links at the bottom if, you, if you're interested, but they, they have a whole AI for good program and they um, work in, in partnership. We're a Microsoft partner uh, with, with organizations uh, to undertake some of these AI for good projects, uh, which BGSS has, has been involved in, in, in some of these, these projects. So it might include environmental problems, ecological understanding, conservation, something which I'm particularly interested in, healthcare, which, uh, you know, I've worked in that as well, social equality and workplace accessibility, humanitarian release. Th these are the kind of things that, it's five broad categories and there's a lot more than that. And these are the kind of things that can really make a difference in a positive impact to people's lives that machine learning can can uh, provide efficient, cost efficient, and um, and potentially more efficient than human uh, solutions to. Misuse isn't always obvious to stakeholders. So when you're communicating to your colleagues and the people that make decisions, don't assume that um, it's obvious um, that something isn't right or something's being misused. It's important to communicate that when you, if you feel that way, and then it may be that you're wrong, it may be that they're wrong, but without a conversation, um, you, you'll never find out. Uh, but it's important to, for, for you as a data scientist and, and, and um, the person who's the expert in the machine learning side of, 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 the, of a project that you communicate the limits of what your solution is capable of and, and the boundaries of what it should be used for. Um, it's all code and as intelligible as, as well documented and well written and formatted as it might be. Um, the majority of your team, you know, if you're working in a multidisciplinary team, aren't going to be able to make head and a tail of it. So you've got to find a way of communicating what you're doing in that code um, to project managers, whoever it is, the people who are going to be taking your solution and put it into production, um, all the people that are working with you and around you. Uh, they, they need to be aware of what it is that your solution is doing for various reasons. Um, but from an ethical standpoint, that, that it's very, very important to, to be able to communicate the key bits of that. It's about summarizing it efficiently. They don't want to know the ins and outs of the mathematical um, decisions you've made and, and what this tiny bit of code does that, you know, seems to be in some uh, transformation on a matrix or whatever it might be. 
they don't need to know that, but you've got to find a way of communicating the key aspects of, of what's going on, especially with regards how data is being processed in it, um, maybe stored. You know, these these all have big implications for um, for for the organisation that you work for. Uh, explainability is a hot topic, and, and rightfully so. Um, this this relates to to bias again, uh, and well, not necessarily bias. It's about transparency. So you need to you may need to be able to explain how your model is making predictions and the level at which you can do that um, depends on a multitude of factors but different there are lots and lots of different machine learning uh, algorithms that you know we're familiar with there are so much are just statistical uh, or, or have been around for ages it's all statistics to be honest under the hood but um, some of them are, are, are traditional statistical models logistic regression would be one um, if you're familiar with that it's a very old and simple way of, of classifying something into either zero or one or anything in between. And um, it's, it's very, people know how it works. It's been around for long enough that people are familiar with it and comfortable with it. So, and you know, it, it, it works, but it may not provide um, uh, the performance that you, you need, in which case you might upscale to other algorithms artificial neural networks is, is one that, that we use nowadays quite frequently. Um, and they're capable of image recognition, uh, reading text and understanding it, all of these really complex things, but they, they're they not particularly transparent. That it's quite difficult to convey how a decision, how that computer has, has come to an individual decision. Um, so that's on the individual kind of, or, or at the prediction level. But we also have overviews of, of how important certain features are to a, to a model at the broad level. So not for individual predictions, but what, where is the information that is important to this model come from? That's something that is easy to explain and is actually relatively easy to, to calculate for any model. Uh, there are frameworks for, for, in, for explainability. And if you're interested, or just Google it. I'm not going to have time to go into more detail now, but um, it's, it's, it's an, a really interesting subject and obviously it depends on the use case as well sometimes it doesn't matter whether you you know what's going on in, in, within the inner workings of, of your machine learning model um other times you may need to explain why did how has it come to this a decision about an individual uh, if you're working at the personal level again but don't forget machine learning isn't all about predicting things about people it can be predicting errors predicting anything um yeah. Oh gosh, got more to go than I thought. We're all right though. There'll be about five minutes at the end for questions if anybody has anything. So I'd have a think now if you have, do have anything to, to ask, and then we can cover that off at the end. Um, so yeah, the, how do you navigate the landscape? You, well, be scientific and be rigorous, be self-critical, be critical in general, but constructively so. It's not about going around pointing fingers and shaking your head. It's about looking at what's going on looking at what you're doing and really having the good old think about it um, try and be objective it's difficult um, and frame any questions that you want to ask neutrally like communication is key um, you have to accrue a lot of information especially if you're a data scientist without really understanding the wider business you should never really be in that situation actually uh, it, you need to understand at least something about the business that you're working in so that you know what's appropriate and what isn't. It doesn't need to be the same level as the MD or, or a, 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 even of somebody who's a business analyst or something like that, but um, it's good to have a, a grounding and know who to ask if there are specific questions that you want to ask about the appropriateness of, of your solution, how that actually feeds into the wider business and um, how it's going to be used. Because you're going to be creating it, you don't want to be. You want to make sure that people are aware of what it does. Uh, you don't want it to just go into production and um, nobody. You, you haven't communicated effectively to the right people. You haven't asked the right questions uh, and got the right information to uh, to make sure that what you're doing is appropriate. I think I'm going to have to skip through really fast because there's quite a lot of slides to go, and uh, this is like say. Okay, subjects which you could do an entire course on but i'm going to quickly talk about sampling appropriately um i've mentioned this already that this sampling regime that you can see under there is not particularly good when we say sampling it means taking some of the data that you've got and using that to teach a machine you often um 
either you don't have access to the full data set or the data are far too numerous to to, to use the full data set to train models. So, and, and sometimes it'll just take ages because it has to crunch all these numbers. So you want to sample. Now you can see here, it's got, it says sample every third. I just took this from, from Microsoft PowerPoint default, whatever it is, online pictures. Um, there are issues there. Uh, good intention, like, you know, they're saying sample every third. And I guess that's to avoid bias towards odd and even numbers. Uh, but there aren't any blue uh, jelly babies on the bottom, are there? You know, it's, how is it? How is your model going to behave if you trained it on that sample on the bottom, release it into production, and then a blue jelly baby comes along? It's not going to know what to do, whatever it's predicting on. Um, it's discriminatory. You know, it, it, there's a bias towards red and green. At worst, um, it'll make terrible decisions about those blue jelly babies. Um, at best, it'll just randomly assign it something or break because it's never seen it before and it doesn't know what to do but you've got to sample appropriately and we won't talk about how to sample appropriately now because uh, yeah it's a subject in its own right but something to be aware of that you do need to have um representative qualities of features uh, well, the representative features and diversity within those features uh, when you train your, any machine learning solution. Otherwise, it's, it's not going to behave. It has to be representative of reality. Um, and testing is important. So that represents, uh, representation of reality, again, comes into, into its own here. Um, when you're sampling, it's important to remember that you, you want to check how this is going to behave when you release it into, into the wild. So you want to sample for a training set, which is what you're going to train your model on. It's what it's going to learn from. So the data that you're going to show the machine learning solution uh, and say, learn from this, please, um, with, with a metaphorical hand holding. Um, but you want a similarly sampled set, which you call the test set or, or, or validation set, um, which is just as representative reality. In fact, you probably want it to be more representative of reality if you can. Uh, ideally, everything is 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 representative of reality. Um, but the machine learning solution has never seen this test set. It's never ever ever been exposed to it. It's no idea what's in there. And then you pass that through your 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 algorithm or your model, uh, get the predictions, and then compare those against reality and see how well it's performing. And if it's performing well on that set, then there's a good chance that when you release it, you know how it's going to behave in 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 the wild because your test set is your mini world, your, your little version of reality. Um, don't worry about the graphs on the right. Uh, I, I was going to talk through those, but it's a bit technical and time is short. Um, it's important to think critically. It, it does does help you uh, and, and everybody else as well. Um, we're scientists, we're, we're thinkers, you know, it's a skill that is valuable to your organization and should be leveraged. And, uh, it's important, it's valuable to you to leverage it yourself, keep your, your skills honed, stay a scientist, uh, but your, your organization should see the value in that as well. It's about being constructively critical, revisiting the problem statement, relating it to how you're working. Are you still on track? Are you still within scope? Are you um, still ethical? <laughs> you're still behaving within an ethical framework. All of those things uh, you need to keep on on top of, like I said, I'm not getting into ethical theory, I'm not getting into ethical um, viewpoints, um, but you know what, what's, what you view as ethical and you know you, you can work within that. You also got to remember that you're, people do, there's a variety within limits, as I say, in how organizations view their ethical responsibilities uh, and individuals. And you know, sometimes you do have to remember that and, and be objective fine to be an influence if you've got an opinion on something but you can't force those opinions on people um uh and and it's it's, it's important to to be respectful of the people around you and the organization that you work for um so sustainability you know we all talk about sustainability now we'd all like to be more sustainable uh, or live more sustainably it applies to profit in organizations too bad ethical practice will just cause problems further down the line you know it, it could result in everybody losing their jobs uh, or it could you know be less dramatic than that but it's it's worth keeping ethics in mind not just for yourself 
and to to satiate your own ethical responsibilities but for, for your organization as well and for the people around you the, the colleagues that you care about you know everybody it's about, about doing the best thing doing doing the right thing and, and maintaining a, a good uh, understanding of, of what's going on in your organization and, and how you can what your impact is on that um, if you don't communicate your ml solution and your data science work uh, to to people up the chain or, or wherever the appropriate people and there's no visibility of that and it's only you that's aware of it and that's that's a bit of a dangerous situation to be in for the company um if you're apprehensive uncertain about an approach discuss it yeah it's the same thing again just just communicate and think critically communicate effectively and extensively don't assume that conversations are happening elsewhere if you have no visibility of them don't just think ah oh, yeah somebody will have thought of that if you thought of it, then you need to make sure that, and, it, and it's and it's important. If you think it's important, um, then you need to have a conversation with it about uh, with somebody. It could be subject matter experts. There's usually subject matter. Well, there's always subject matter experts available within an organisation that you work in. When I say subject matter experts, um, that would differ across different parts of the business. If it's a financial solution, then it'd be the finance department who are the SMEs. If it's um, something to do with uh, process, you know, or, or, or HR, then that's HR. If it's something to do with um a physical factory then it'd be the engineers who you need to go and speak to if it's a computing solution then it'd be the devs you know speak to those people because you don't know everything as a data scientist but you are going to be using the knowledge that they have and data based on uh, on that subject matter to build solutions so it's important to to clue yourself up more rather than less if you can um five minutes okay uh, I think we've pretty much spoken about everything else. I think it's important there to say, uh, well, yeah, how, how does your work relate to human tasks? Speak to those people um, and reassure them. Like we're not, we're not there to replace jobs. So we, we, hopefully, uh, you know, that, that's an ethical conundrum in itself, isn't it? Um, but we're here to provide solutions that assist humans. And it's about augmenting. Uh, and hopefully uh, making p allowing people to make better decisions. It may be that your organization doesn't have enough money to to um, staff to the level that they would like to. So you use the staff that you've got, but you can augment that with machines potentially. Lots of use cases which work in harmony with, with humans and it's important to remember that too. Don't be like these two people on the bottom right. Um, you know, be compassionate, rational, avoid conflict, all the usual stuff, be sensible. And be respectful um you may have an opinion on things but bear in mind other people do too and you don't want to get into an argument in terms of how to frame or, or if you if you're unsure about what what's going on in terms of ethical practices or well, not ethical practices in terms of practices from an ethical standpoint use the existing frameworks that, that exist that, that we live in um in a, in a country which is, is 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 reasonably good when it comes to understanding what our duties are as citizens um legislature guidelines your organizational policies professional bodies all of these things um say you use your phone and a friend lifeline there that might you know it depends on how freely you can talk about the work that you're doing it could be a colleague um, if it if it's if you're able to talk to real friends yeah, that sounds terrible and I do have real friends at work as well or friends outside of work then you can talk to them too you know, just get get a general opinion within the framework that you're allowed to talk about your your, your work um, maybe due to commercial sensitivity you can't be as, uh, speak as freely as you'd like to um, but speak to people and, and get get a build up at that objective view based on multitude of, pers of uh, perspectives if in doubt, look up in reputable sources and read the flipping manual. Um, yeah, I think that, that's it relevant. It's a fast moving subject data science and machine learning. Um, there's a lot <laughs> constantly reading, constantly keeping yourself in your toes and constantly testing and trialing new methods. Um, keep on top of, of uh, the, the details of what you're doing and, um, and, and look at look at primary literature and reputable sources on the internet. Don't go to unreputable sources, you know, they, if you're a scientist, you know how to do um, good research, stick to those principles. Okay, I think that's just about time, five minutes left, well, four minutes, so apologies, slightly over. 
but uh, I'm ready to field some questions if, if people have any. Thanks, Chris, for such a brilliant talk. We do have a question from Felix. Um, do you think that striving to adapt an objective view can lure someone into a false sense of security by rationalizing one's subjective biases? And if so, what techniques can be used to get close to the goal of true objectivity? Okay, so um, the kind of confirmation bias, I think you're, you're talking about. The, the thing, it's, a, it's an interesting question, uh, FA, I, I know who it is. I don't know whether I'm allowed to say it. It's probably a breach of GDPR, isn't it? But yeah, interesting question. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's, it's about being a scientist again. It, it, you don't confirm your own, or you try to avoid confirming your own subjective biases and have real hypotheses that you can test and run those hypotheses by people. Uh, and bear in mind that hypotheses isn't self-affirming. It shouldn't be, you know, you, you can go either way, you either prove or disprove a hypothesis. Don't be proud about that either. Don't try and do everything in your power to make sure that your hypothesis is correct it either is or it isn't and you apply scientific methods to that and you'll find out it, it, you, can, you do end up having some really quite difficult conversations in, in as a data scientist uh, or what, what might be perceived as difficult conversations because you do have to admit that you've been wrong sometimes and it's a hard thing to do um i think that's an answer to the question you're asking it's, it's quite a long question but uh, feel free to to email me or, or get in touch in through the channels uh, that are available afterwards if you want a more detailed discussion. I believe that's everything. Just waiting a second to see if anyone else has any questions. Uh, if you I'm need really to find, to <laughs> if you need to find the Q and A uh, area, um, it's just on the bottom uh, panel. Um, you just press the Q and A button, uh, and it brings up a pop up which you can type your question into um, if you're struggling to find it. I believe as well, Chris can answer any questions afterwards. Um, and you are planning to put your email into the chat, aren't you, Chris, so that people can reach out to you? Absolutely, I'll do that now. And then, yeah, if you're interested in, in hearing more about data science in general, not just from an ethical lens, but, you know, I, I, something that I can talk all day about. So please feel free to, to get in touch. We do have another question. Um, so we have one from Peter. Uh, what platform would you recommend for an aspiring data scientist? Uh, well, this is a tr tr tricky question. It? And it, it, by platform, I assume you mean um, either cloud provider or software that you might use or, or, or something like that. Um, I'm not going to make any recommendations in this talk on that, but we can talk about that afterwards if, if you'd like. There's lots of different platforms available. Um, some are open source, some aren't. It depends on, on what your priorities are. Um, so yeah, we, 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 can, we can talk about that in more detail, but I'm not gonna recommend a platform, I'm afraid. All right, I think that's probably all of our questions. And um, thank you everyone for attending. Um, I hope you really enjoyed this webinar. Uh, absolutely brilliant talk, Chris. Um, so yeah, everyone have a lovely Wednesday evening um, and thank you so much. Cheers guys.